Hey, welcome to the class tease for the Animation Process Explained um, overview, or how to create a Pixar style film without a Pixar style budget. I am Ethan Hill, and I will be joined for the official class by my sister Savannah, and what we'll be covering. So just as far as an overview, we are going to try to hit a 20,000 foot view level, covering a lot of the different topics that go into creating a short animated film without going too in depth in any of them. Our goal here with this class is really to give you sort of a jump start on creating your first or your next uh, animated film. And one of the first topics we're gonna to touch on here today is the Pixar story in a nutshell. So this is one of uh, Emma Coates' 22 rules of Pixar storytelling. And basically think of it like a quick recipe framework or structure for your animated film that you can kind of structure it for. And it goes like this, once upon a time there was a blank, every day blank one day because of that because of that until finally and ever since that day and so this is just a bunch of points to think about as you're structuring your film as far as what needs to happen that needs to lead into the next thing that needs to lead into the next thing the audience has come to expect a certain framework or certain structures or a certain emotional journey when it comes to a film so the more that we can deliver on that on those expectations in a new and exciting way, the better. Probably one of the more popular and well-known structure is the Blake Snyder beat sheet, and this is from uh, Blake Snyder's book, Save the Cat. And in it, he goes through and details on a feature film what that looks like plot by plot, what point, what minute did what event happens. And as you go about watching movies, after you've seen this, you'll be surprised at how repetitive or how predictive films really are. As you see, every single film just about hits all these plot points at this certain uh, minute marker in the film. If you think about it, there really is a parallel to the greatest story ever, which is the story of the gospel, the story of mankind created in paradise, leading to the fall, which is the catalyst for man being cut off from God, who eventually sends his son, who appears to be the hero who saves the day, but then that the dark night of the soul as the hero is killed on the cross, which then leads to the resurrection and the hope of eternity in the hearts of mankind. At its core, though, if you think about it, a story is basically... A character who has a desire who faces an obstacle and we can get weighed down into these complicated structures and what minute and what point and all that kind of stuff but really at its core hero obstacle payoff the greater you make the obstacle the greater the payoff's going to be at the end the more the hero has to work for his desire the more sweet the victory is going to be at the end and you think about that any superhero film the more you throw at the main character the protagonist the greater the payoff is going to be at the end feeding your film or your script to a team of sharks who can really tear it apart and tell you what's wrong with it is a super important part of the filmmaking process but so often we can be too attached too close to the story that we can often miss some of the things that are pretty obvious to people coming in from the outside I'm sure we're all pretty familiar with the storyboarding process, just creating a sketch of every single shot of your film so that as you're going to animate, as you're going to create it in the 3D world, you've got a rough idea of what it's going to look like, where the character is going to be in relation to the camera and whatnot. It's important to get this down on paper so that as you get to 3D software, you're not wasting time rendering shots, re-rendering shots, and all that goes along with that. Uh, the natural next step for that is the animatic, and that's just taking your storyboard. Take your phone, take a picture of every single frame of your storyboard, and turn that into a rough edit of your film. So you can add music, sound effects if you want, even voiceover or whatnot. But this is where you're starting to create the edit so that you can send it to your composer, to your sound designer as you're going so they can start to get some idea of what it's going to look like. But it's an important step for animation because the animators, we rely a lot on the timing and pacing of an edit such as this so we can get it right as we go along rendering and animating the shot. And if you're not big enough to be able to afford a dedicated art department of your own, you're probably going to do a lot of mood boards. And these are just basically look or style sheets that you create, pulling reference images from other videos, from magazines, from other places on the internet. Don't worry about copyright. This is just for you or your team as you're creating your film. You're just creating a style or look sheet so that you have something, you have a measurable goal to reference or you know what this shot is going to look like because you've created sample references. So this is kind of what we're picturing. This is what we're shooting for. And it enables you to get a lot closer than you would if you didn't have a reference, something you're shooting for. We use the software Blender. It's a great free software, open source software. It does, the biggest downside of it is it does have a steep learning curve or a little bit of a difficult interface to get used to. But the bright side of that is it does have a great education community online. So YouTube, other tutorials online, a lot of people willing to help you get started and get going with it. One of our favorites as we were getting started was Andrew Price with Blender Guru. He's got a lot of great tutorials out there that can help you get going as you're looking to get started. Probably the most difficult part of your animated film is going to be with the characters, just because they really are the face of your film. Here's a time lapse of Garrison sculpting the boy from A Boy's War. He actually went through 20 iterations of this character before he was happy with it. Honestly, I think I was happy with iteration two, maybe three, but I'm glad he kept with it because he got something he was happy with and I think it turned out really great for the film and the style character we were going for. Another option, you could just create french fries as your characters. 
uh, more on that later. And then the step between the actual character creation and the animation is the rigging. Surfacing is where you start to give color, texture to the objects that you've created. So here you can see the Mini Cooper starts out as kind of a dull gray color, and that's how everything starts in the modeling phase. Then as you move to surfacing, you're starting to give things color. Here you can see you've defined what's red, what's white, what's shiny, what's transparent, what's translucent, what has texture, what has bumps. This is where you really start to give the life. Like remember to work off of your mood boards and your color scripts as you're creating the materials and textures for your scene because all your objects in your shot really make up the color of the shot, the mood of the shot, and how that plays into the overall story. Something super important that we found when creating the animation for your film is to record or find sample actor clips. You either record yourself reenacting the shot that you're looking and animating or find someone else who's done it or here you can see our example is the dance from Cinderella that we use for our scene father-daughter dance so that way you've got realistic or accurate motion to work off of as you're animating your shot it's so often you've got something in your head or you think oh it'll look like this and then you start to put that down and animate your characters and you're like that looks nothing like it actually looks like so having an accurate reference such as that makes it a lot easier to get realistic or convincing looking animation. Motion capture is also a big thing nowadays with a lot of animations opting to do motion capture suits and rigs as they link those to their characters in 3D so that they only have to have actors moving their characters and then you're just refining the rig as the rig mirrors the actor. But on our budget that's not really an option so moving right along. Just as a quick overview of the actual animation process you usually start with somewhat of a rough blocking phase. So here you're going to set some of the main key frames of the action. Here you can see the graphic from the animation survival kit. I haven't actually read the book but I thought it was a great graphic. And it just goes over on the top there you can see we've got three main actions in this shot. So walking, picking up the chalk, writing on a chalkboard. So you just block out what does it look like walking, bending down, and then writing on the chalkboard. And then as you move into the second phase, after you've completed the main keyframes, you're gonna start doing, well, what does it look like in between? So here you're kind of filling in the key points, the breakdowns, if you would. And this is where it's super helpful to have those sample actor clips, because now you can reference or reenact it yourself and say, well, what does it actually look like as I go from bending down, picking up chalk, to writing on the board? What does it actually look like in real life? What's my left back foot doing as I'm doing this? And you can get an accurate view for what that's actually gonna look like. And then the final stage there, step three, is just filling everything in and polishing it off. A big thing to think about when you're animating your character, you are almost the actor as you're bringing this character to life. So how, what can you do to give it its own unique personality? Here you can see the characters from Winnie the Pooh and how each one actually has a very distinct or unique walk cycle so you could see just the motion of one character and probably tell which character it was so think about how you're going to bring them to life what personality you can give them through that and so what's the backstory that leads into that what does the story say that should dictate how this character acts and reacts in this shot so does he need a limp here? Is he supposed to be shuffling? Is he wore out? Is he energized and enthusiastic right here? Use all these things as you're animating the character throughout this process. From the book, The Illusion of Life, the legendary Disney animators, Frank Thomas and Ole Johnston, and the 12 principles of animation. And I just want to go over those real quick because I think they are super important as far as refining and getting a professional looking animation. And so just one by one, we've got the squash and stretch. We've got anticipation. We've got staging, pose to pose, follow through and overlapping action, slow in and slow out, arcs, secondary action, timing, exaggeration, solid drawings, and appeal. And one of the things as we've gone along is these 12 principles of animation aren't just helpful hints to use as you're going along, something to think about from time to time. These are like the rules of animation. If you want to create a professional shot, don't just think about these. Use every single one in this shot in the motion that you're creating. And I mentioned french fries before. Here's the spud stick tail of Jonah and the whale. <laughs> Too bad I forgot my fishing pole. <laughs> uh, okay, I think that's enough. And we're going to move right along. Lighting and cinematography, one of my favorite topics here, I think. Also one of Pixar's secret sauce. If you think about lighting in Pixar films, I think it's really what's differentiated them from a lot of the other studios, the creative films, is that they, I was watching the credits for Monsters U the other day, and they had 49 animators, 42 lighting technicians. Next time you watch a film, try watching it upside down and muted. You'll actually pay a lot more attention to the cinematography, the framing of the shot, the composition, as you're going through watching it, because your mind will not get pulled into the story as well because it's a lot harder to when it's upside down and muted. Just to touch on a quick advanced tip here, if you're looking at getting the Pixar look in Blender and you're using the Cycles Render Engine, the best thing you can do for yourself is to enable the full global illumination. It's defaulted on the limited global illumination. By enabling full global illumination, it basically just enables more bounces of light so that you get more of a... 
a lot more bounces of light. Biggest downside though is that you spend a lot more time and money rendering, but that's kind of the rules of the game. Advanced step, I don't want to go too far in the weeds there. Rendering is the process of creating the actual 2D image or animation from the prepared scene. This can be compared to taking a photo or filming the scene after the setup is finished in real life. But I think better than an actual Wikipedia definition is a before and after shot so you can see what's going on here. We've got the default gray look here and then we transition to the final rendered view. And so really what's happening here is the computer is calculating, well, what does the lighting look like? What does the textures look like? What do the colors look like? What happens when the sun shines through the window and what goes on inside and outside? What do the leaves do? It's basically doing all the calculations to produce the final image. If everything goes right, you will hopefully reach the end and reach the release phase, which is one of the most overlooked steps often, just because we like to be more focused on creating the film rather than releasing it. It's not exactly what we got into the game for. But I think starting with the end in mind is important, and so also having some parameters set up ahead of time as to how and where you want to release it is super important. And so I think a couple of things to think about as you're getting started is, can you create this as a cause-based? Is there a cause or ministry that you can get behind with your film so that as you're releasing it, You've got somewhat of an audience already out there who would be hungry for the content that you're producing. That way you're not creating it for a market that might not even be there. You know the people are there and you can cater the content for them with the target demographic in mind. And here are some key points to think about as you create your first or your next animated film. Hopefully some helpful thoughts and ideas throughout this talk that you can pick up and use. And just to close, I do think it's important to create your first film to get to where you wanna go. So don't be afraid of creating your French Fry film to get to creating your Pixar styled films. I think it's an important step. I don't think that we would get to creating a Boys War or Father Daughter Dance if we hadn't created our Spud Stick tale of Jonah and the Whale. And just as kind of a final word before we leave, until you spread your wings, you'll have no idea how far you can walk. Completely random, doesn't tie into this talk at all, but. I hope it's helpful and look forward to seeing y'all at the 2020 Christian Worldview Film Festival. See ya.